A few weeks ago and last year, you remember I said that uh, I was going to go into the, the letter of Peter, and I'm on my way to that letter. But uh, last week or the week before, Brother Oral preached here about the law. And it is so wonderful that uh, when he read, he said that when they started reading the law, it was from the morning till the afternoon. The morning till the afternoon. People were so eager to hear the law. They were so eager. They were standing listening to it. And yet we have now churches who only preach for 15 minutes. That's, that's the allocation for the Word of God. I want to hear more about the Word of God. I've actually said to people, we, we, we don't have to have worship. We have to have the table and the preaching of the Word. I know the Bible says we worship God, but worship is not only singing. Your life is worshiping God. And all you do when you come to worship God through singing is you overflow. You overflow. If you overflow from the worship and the love of God during the week, singing in church shouldn't be a problem for you. doesn't matter whether you're off key, whether you are false according to people, whether what. All you do is you overflow. And you see the thing here is that that becomes a sweet aroma before God. Because He sees your heart. That's what He sees. So uh, I was on my way, and I'm still on my way to, to the book of Peter, and I believe the Lord's going to bless this church as we work through that letter. But as uh, Brother Oro was talking about the law, I thought, you know what, I think before we go there, I want to talk to you about the law. The law. It's written in your Bible. It is in the Old Testament. When I talk about law here, I talk about the law of God. This law. And I'm just going to open up the passage for you in the next few Sundays, how the Lord leads me to take this. I want us to go into the law. Because I want to tell you something, brothers and sisters, I see this happening in our day and time, where you've got people sitting in churches who don't even know the sin that they were saved from. They don't understand it. How can you say that you are saved from something that you didn't see or understand what it is? And this is the purpose of the law. The law of God brings you to a point where you can see yourself through His eyes. So I want to talk to you starting today about the law. And in specific today, the key of knowledge. The key of knowledge. And I want you to open up in your Bibles in Luke chapter 11. You see, one thing I want to say to you as I start speaking about the law... The Ten Commandments, and it's not only the Ten Commandments, because there are many other laws which is written in Exodus and in the book of Deuteronomy. I'm not going to go through each one of them because there are many, there are plenty. We're going to co focus and concentrate on the Ten Commandments. But the purpose of this series is not to make you feel guilty. I don't want you to walk out of this place feeling guilty in the next few weeks as I'm opening up the law to you. It's not that. But it is to convict you. That's what it is. I'm open with you. I'm transparent. Isn't it right, Bron? In this church we say it as it is. There's no you know, hiding stuff around here. So I'm not trying to make you guilty, but as I'm preaching, I pray the Holy Spirit convict you and to demonstrate the amazing grace. Everybody say amazing grace. Amazing. Who knows that you are sitting here because of His amazing grace? But I'm telling you now that we demonstrate the amazing grace bestowed upon you through the cross of Calvary. That's the purpose. You see, there's a difference between feeling guilty and being convicted. There's a difference. Did you know that? You see, a lot of people feel guilty, but guilty focuses on me. That's what guilty does. It focuses on me. Guilty is that we are responsible for our own salvation. And we work so hard. We find so many people still in churches who work so hard on their salvation, they always feel guilty. They feel guilty and they feel guilty. It focuses on me. And I want to get the problem solved as quickly as possible to take the, the spotlight away from me. They try so hard and it, it leads to false sorrow. I've seen it so many times. I can spot crocodile tears a mile away. 
And you can too. Have you ever been in a place where people were crying and you could see it's crocodile tears and you go away from that place and you say to somebody, that, that was only crocodile tears. But you can see deeply sorrow as well. And this is what guilt do. You see, guilt you is, is focuses on you. But conviction, on the other hand, focuses on God. And it's the Holy Spirit to point out your sin in your life and it leads to repentance. This is why I say, I pray the Lord and I've been praying for, you know, it's been now two weeks that this is laying upon my heart that I say, Lord, please convict our hearts. Convict, convict my heart. So that if you find in me something which is not right, that I repent thereof. Now, if you're afraid of that, you are welcome to go to sleep right now. I'll wake you up at the end. Yeah? So the definition for law is a system of rules which a particular country or community recognizes and it regulating the actions of that community and of its members and in which it may enforce by the imposition or the or the impartation of penalties. What this definition is saying to you me is, it says where there is a law, there is judgment. And this is why the people want to walk away from the law. Because if they see the law, there is judgment. I mean, there's a law on this road down here, on this, if you go down here. Now, I see a young brother in the church came this morning on his motorbike for the first time. He's got L plates on it. I won't highlight the brother out. But... But he would have learned in his L plates that there's laws in these roads. And that road down there says 80 kilometers an hour, young people. That's what the law says. Now, if you go over 80 kilometers an hour, what happens? There is judgment. It is just how it works. If you go 100 on it, and they, oh, if you go 90 over it, you're going to get a fat fine. And you've got to pay that fine. If you go 100 over it, you're going to lose your motorbike car. So this is it. You know, there's laws and there's judgment. But the same principle then applies to the Word of God. We are sitting here under the Australian law, and we need to abide by the Australian law. There are certain things that we cannot do. If we do them, they will give a judgment on us and either give us a fine, or you will go to jail. You will, you will pay a penalty for that. Now, the purpose for laws is to keep the society safe and orderly. Isn't that right? There's traffic lights at the end of this. Isn't that right? So you go 80 miles an hour, kilometers an hour, and you get to the traffic lights and you see the red light. Now, red doesn't say go. What does that red say? It says stop. If everybody don't want to abide by that, we're going to have an accident right there. This is why it keeps things orderly and it keeps things safe. And this is so true to the Word of God, the law of God. Because the law, of, and, and by the way, let me just say, all the law, all the law, Australian law, which is actually under the England law, originally when it was, came down here, all of that law is based on the Word of God. Even the atheist who says to you, I don't believe in God, abide by God's laws. Because even everything around us is tied to the Word of God. But then there is spiritual laws as well. That if you break the spiritual law, there is judgment upon you. You see, young people and people my age and older, which means everybody in this church, if you're going to break the laws, the moral laws of the Bible, you're going to find you in a place that you don't like where you are. And you can be locked in for life. This is why I say to young people, think before you do. Don't make decisions when you're emotional. Don't break certain things because you're going to find you in a place where you're not happy and you're going to come to the pastor and say, Oh, I don't like it. Pray that God takes it away from me. And I'm going to say, No, Lord, take them through it. So this is true. If you abolish the law, you have lawlessness. You have lawlessness. And we saw this in America a few years ago when they abolished the law and you saw buildings burn and cars burn and all of these things. And let me just say right now, the only thing that keeps lawlessness away from the world right now is one word only or two words, Holy Spirit of God. 
He's the restrainer. Once the restrainer is removed from this earth, you don't want to be on this earth. Because every man will do what is right in his own eyes. It has been there before. It's nothing new. It's in the Bible. It's all over. So now with that in mind, let's go to Luke chapter 11. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to read it in context and then we're going to come to our verse that I want to use as a foundation for the next few weeks. So, <coughs> so we go to Luke chapter 11 verse 37. I want you to have a look there. Jesus is now encountering the Pharisees and the scribes. And I'm going to read through this and I'm going to do expository teaching as I go through this. And I'm going to stop in certain places because I believe the Holy Spirit can still speak to everyone uh, as we go through this. He says, and as he spoke, this is Jesus, a certain Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went in and he sat down to eat. And when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed his hands before dinner. You see, washing of the hands before the dinner was something which they do as a ritual. And there was a specific way of doing it. It's not just walking up to the basin. It doesn't say that Jesus was dirty. No, no, he knew hygiene. But what it was here was an ordinance. It was a specific way. They had to hold their hands up like this and water was dripped onto their hands. And then they had to take their fist and rub it into the one side and then water dripped and rub it into the other side. And then finally they hold their hands and the water was poured on the top and runs down their arms and then it drops down from their elbows into the ground. That is every single time when a Pharisee wants to eat, they had to wash their hands. Now Jesus didn't do that. And these people then looked at him, shocked, amazed. He says, and they marveled. They, you know, it's, it's a big thing for them. It's the ordinances of their forefathers which they've put into place. Now let's see what happens. Then the Lord said to them, to him, Now you Pharisees make the outside of the cup and the dish clean, but your inward part is full of greed and wickedness. Foolish ones, did not he who made the outside make the inside also, but rather he gave arms and such of the things have, then indeed all things are clean to you. And we can learn a lesson from this, you and I sitting in this place. You see, when you come into this church, people see the outside, and they see your smile, and they see your friendliness, and, but what they don't see is what is on the inside. I always say is what's happening when you close your doors. You know, you can come in here and you can be the best brother in the church and everybody goes, wow, have you seen that brother? And man, when he prays the Lord, his hands is up. And when he prays, heaven comes down and heaven is in the church. And when he sings hallelujah, praise the Lord. Man, I get such a holy feeling when he sings hallelujah. Get him to sing hallelujah. But brothers and sisters, let me ask your wife, your, your, your husband. Let me ask your children, how is mom? How is dad? How is uh, Johnny? How is Sarah at home? When the church don't see them. That's the testimony that counts. Jesus touches on this. He touches on this here when he, when he talks about it. He says there that, you know, these people, they are on the outside so clean, they are so beautiful, but inside there's greed and wickedness. And he takes us back to Genesis chapter 6, when Noah was around. You know that time when Noah was around? And it said that the people of that age were full of greed and wickedness and violence filled the earth. How is the violence in your family? I'm not talking you beating somebody up. I'm talking about the words that comes out of your mouth. How are you dealing with your, your better half, as they say? How are you dealing with your children? I, I pray the Lord that I'm speaking to maybe somebody online here or somebody in this church. Because the Bible says in Proverbs that when we can use this tongue as knives, we can use it as knives. And he says it right there. He says you are so clean on the outside. You, you're this beautifully, but inward. The part where people can't see, but, everybody say but. but. God can see it. God knows. Not only God knows, but the angels see that as well. 
I say to you this morning, I don't want you to be feeling guilty. I want you to be convicted. So here he talks to these people who are so worried about he didn't wash his hands in that proper manner, but there's a bigger issue at home. You can be religious, but on your way to hell. You can sit in church and still be on your way to hell if you are not born again. Now, I'm not talking about people falling away. And here it is, so true. It is so straightforward, and we need to hear this. And then we continue on. He says, but woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass by justice and the love of God. Those ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. And again, you know, I know he's talking to Pharisees here, but the, 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 the mistake a lot of people are doing is says, yeah, but I'm not a Pharisee. But you can be a Pharisee. If you're the one who preaches to others, but you do that thing, you're a Pharisee. So I, I want to apply this. I want to say, Lord, speak to me today. You see, when it says they tithe mint and ruin herbs, they meticulously counted out the mints. They would go, I got mint and then 10% of that goes in. And it was such a beautiful show in front of people to do this thing. Even, even to the smallest thing. They didn't have to do it to the herbs even, but they are showing it outside. But they were so focused on that, that there's two things they forgot. It's the justice of God and the love of God. And let it be known in the Bible, justice and love goes together. God's justice and His love goes together. You can't claim God's love without His justice. And I see this so many times these days. People are claiming the love of God, but they forget about the justice of God. If you sin this morning, you've got, you've got uh, the consequences for that sin and it will be judged. You can say to me as much as you want that God is a loving God. Let me just do a room temperature. It's not too hard, is it? We're talking about the law. I'm talking the word, my sister. So we look at verse 44 now. He says, Woe to you, scribes. These lawyers coming in now, the scribes and Pharisees. Hypocrites. He calls them out hypocrites. For you are like graves which are not seen, and the men who walk over them are not aware of them. And let it be known for those people who would listen online, and those preachers who would listen online, who's taking so many people under the banner of Christianity on their own mission and their own agendas. This is what he addresses here. I want to tell you this something. What is he saying here? You see, for a Jew, when they walk over a grave, they are unclean for seven days according to their law unclean this is why the jews went out and they took white uh, paint it's not paint but a, car, uh, a chalk and they would they would paint the graves white so that the jews could walk and see there is a grave there is a grave and they not walk over them so what is the point jesus wants to make here he says to them you scribes and pharisees for you are like graves which are not seen. In other words, there's a grave which is not seen. The Jew walks over it, he didn't even see it, and now he's unclean. There are people who are operating in churches like that. They are taking people in an unholy direction. Under the banner of Christianity. I'm just going to say it as it is. If you are by now upset with me, God bless your heart. I told you we're getting to our verse. But it's the law. Yes. Now the, the thing is, you say, oh yeah, all those preachers on TV, I can name them one by one, but I want to ask you, what are you doing? Are you doing that? Are you setting up graves which are not seen? Are you putting things in place for other people? Are you digging pits for other people to fall in? Are you backbiting and backstabbing other people? That's the same thing. It's just different words. I love the word of God. It cuts like a knife. And in verse 45, he says, Then one of the lawyers answered and said to him, You see, here comes these very clever lawyers. The lawyers. The lawyers stand up. He said, Whoa, whoa, wait a minute here, Jesus. Teacher, by saying these things, you reproach us also. 
And he said, now I love it when Jesus, he's not even answering. He's not even coming over and says, no, no, I love you lawyers, man. I'm going to need a lawyer one day. You know, if, if I'm good to you, I can count on you not to charge me too much. No, no. He went straight to it. He says, woe to you also lawyers, for you load men with burdens hard to bear, and you yourself do not touch the burdens which with one of your fingers. And I, man, I can go on. There's a whole sermon that I can preach in this, where there are people who are putting so many any spiritual uh, burdens upon people where the spirit of the Lord where he is there is freedom this is why I say in this church if you come in there's no rules and laws that I can give you there's only one law it's the word of God if you abide by the word of God praise the Lord you're in the right place but I hurry up verse 47 for you Woe to you, for you built the tombs of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. In fact, you bear witness that you approved the deeds of your fathers. You see, they built these witnesses up. That's what lawyers do, these, these scheming lawyers. For they indeed killed them, and you built their tombs. Therefore the wisdom of God also said, I will send them to uh, prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill and persecute, and that's happened that the blood of all of the prophets which uh, was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the temple, yes, I say to you, it shall be required of this generation. I'm reading this to you to put it into context where I'm going. Look at verse 52 now. This is where we're going to find our word. Jesus then stands there and he talks to these lawyers. They say, oh, but you are saying it to us now as well, Jesus. We are not like those Pharisees, but they are lawyers. And now he says to them, woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. Everybody say key of knowledge. He says to these lawyers, there is a woe upon you. For you've taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter in yourselves. And those who were entering in, you hindered. You stopped people to enter in. Why? Because they've taken away what? A key. What does a key do? It opens a door. There's a key that opens a door. And if you've got the key, you've got the authority to open the door. If you go to my house now, the door is locked. You haven't got a key. You can do one of two things. You can turn around and go away. Because if the door is locked, you're not welcome. Is that right? Or you can just boot it open. And then you're in trouble. But if you've got the key, if I give you the key, you've got the authority to walk into my house and open that door. And here it is important. He says to them, there is a key which was given to you, the lawyers, of knowledge. And you have taken it away. He has given this key to us. He's given it to that nation. I will come to that. I'll give you the distinction there. But he talks about this key of knowledge. Let me finish and I'll come back and explain. Because I'm talking about this key. In verse 53 he says, And he said these things to them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to assail him vehemently, and to cross-examine him about many things, laying and wait for him, and seeking to catch him in something he might say that they may accuse him. You see, they didn't like what he said. And so a lot of people won't like it when you preach the truth from the pulpit. They will run from the, for the doors and I say, you are welcome. But what is this key of knowledge? What is he talking about? Why is it a woe to these lawyers? You see, a lawyer is somebody, there's two things they had to do. First of all, they had to uphold the law. What do I mean by that? They're not police officers, but they are the ones who form the laws. They are the ones who, when they receive the law, explain the law to the people. That's what the lawyers do. That's their purpose. And they had to do these things. But then, so, so first of all, they had to teach these laws to them. And by upholding them. So the question is then, what is the key of knowledge Jesus was talking here to the lawyers about? 
Well, brothers and sisters, the law of God is the key of the knowledge that he was pointing towards here. He was pointing towards the law. The Ten Commandments, if you want to have it like that. He said to these lawyers, you have taken away the key of knowledge. You have taken away the law. Instead of teaching the law to the people which was given to Moses on Mount Sinai, these lawyers, what did they do? They started teaching the origins of man. They started teaching people how to wash your hands. They started saying, oh, that's not lawful what you do there. So they moved away from God's law, set up their own law, and now they're starting to trap people by that law. What's out for people who's trying to do it today? Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom in Christ. But these men, they had to do this. They had to teach the law to the nations. They had to uphold the rule of law to the nation. And this was given to the Jewish people for a purpose. But they got themselves involved into these rituals. And they got themselves involved into these ornaments and to these traditions. And they started trad teaching traditions instead of the law of God. Say, so they should have taught the law. Why? Why is the law so important? Why did God give the law? So that man could realize that he is a sinner. That is the purpose of the law. They should have taught the law so that the sinners would get the knowledge of their sin and to realize that they need a Savior. Is that how you came to the Lord? You are sitting here this morning and you say you are born again. You are washed by the blood of the Lamb. How did you come to that? How did you come to that? Were you sitting in a church and they made an altar call and somebody tapped you on the shoulder and said, do you also want to go? And you started feeling guilty, you see? You see, that's the word guilty. And then you were, I'm not, I'm, look, listen to me, brothers and sisters. I'm not testing your salvation here this morning. That's over to you and the Holy Spirit. But what I'm saying is, when you came to Him, when you stood in front of that cross, did you see the sin that you committed against the Holy God? This is what I'm saying. Let's be serious about this. This is why the law came in. Remember before the law. What was before the law? We go back to Noah's days. There were violence. There were greed. There were wickedness on the earth. And, and let me say, the Bible says, Jesus says it will be in our days now like as in the days of Noah. You see the same things happening in our world today. And it's going to get worse. How are you fitting into that? But I, but, but I don't want to, look, look, I want to come back. I want you not to concentrate on those things. I want to concentrate on this one thing that I'm putting in front of you. When you came to the cross of Christ, when you bowed down and you said, Lord, save my soul, and He came because He found you, you didn't find Him. He laid the Holy Spirit upon you. The conviction of the Spirit came upon you. The judgment came upon you. And when you sat before that throne, did you say, Lord, I can surely see now my sin, my folly, I need a Savior. Was that you? You see, gone with all of this fluff that people are trying to put under the gospel these days. You find these, these days people come and they say they are born again without ever confessing their sins before a holy God. And this is what it comes down to. He, he talks to these lawyers. He says, woe to you. There's a penalty waiting for these people who's taken, who's taken the key of knowledge away. And when I read this verse and the Holy Spirit came upon my heart and convicted myself, I said, Lord, shall it not be upon this man not to preach this message in church? Because I don't want to be one of those lawyers. I want to preach it as it is, brothers and sisters. You need to be convicted of your sin. You see, the thing is these days, you get people who come and they quickly, they quickly say, Lord, save my soul. And they pray the prayer and they go on with their old life. No conviction. No conviction. But let it be known today that if He, He will stand, you will stand before Him to one day. And the law which you neglect will convict you. Yeah, I know it's a hard message, but it's a true message. Now let's follow this key, because you say, explain to me, wow, the key of knowledge. Where did you get that this is the law of God? Well, we'll have to go back to Genesis. And we see in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, the very first law that came in. The very first law. 
Uh, we know that God created the universe and God created everything. He created Adam. And then it comes in chapter 2 verse 16 where it says in the Bible, And the Lord God commanded the man. You see the word commanded there? That's a law. He laid down a law to him. He said to him, This is my commandment to you. And you shall not break that commandment. Because if you break that commandment, there is a judgment. This is it, the very first one. And he came to him and he said, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree of what? But of the tree of what, church? Knowledge. Of what, church? Knowledge. But of the tree of knowledge, of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. You see, God set a key down there. He says to him here, he says, you can eat all of the trees, but this tree, this tree of knowledge of good and evil. At this point in time, Adam was in a dispensation of innocence. Innocence. He was innocent. He was at that point in time perfect. He was the only one who wasn't born perfect. He was created perfect. And here walks this perfect man in unity with God. In spirit with God. God spoke to him like I'm speaking to you. And God comes to him and he says to him, There is some knowledge which I don't want you to have. And I'm going to put a commandment on that. What is that commandment? The knowledge of the tree of good and evil. If you're going to eat of that tree, what's going to happen? You're going to understand good and evil. And that dispensation of innocence is gone. It's gone. So here we find that. The key of knowledge, what knowledge is it? It's the key of good and evil and the end of a dispensation of innocence. So in chapter 3, really interesting, it is so interesting that God spoke to Adam here. He spoke to the man. He didn't speak to the woman. He didn't speak to Eve. I don't believe Eve was even created at this point in time when he spoke to Adam. And that's why I believe there is a certain order for God. Not because we chose it, it's because God put it in place. He spoke to him and then Adam then told Eve. So Eve didn't get it directly from God, but she got it from Adam. And what happened? We see this whole account happening here in chapter, chapter 3 verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasing to the eyes and desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and she ate. She also gave to her husband with her and they ate. What did they do? They ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Then, everybody say then. Yes. There's a knowledge here. Then, the eyes of both of them were opened. Why? They saw for the first time this knowledge. They realized something happened. They were opened and they knew that they were naked. Before this, they didn't know this. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings because they want to cover. Why did they have to cover something now? Because all of a sudden they realize the difference between good and evil. And now they try to cover. And they heard the sound of Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of God amongst the trees of the garden. Why? Because they broke the law. There was only one law. There was only one. Don't eat. Here is the Israelites. Here is them. They've got so many. They've got ten for a starter. But then go and read the whole book of Deuteronomy. There's plenty. And there's even more in the New Testament of things to do and not to do. And they had one. And they couldn't even hold the one. Where is the person who comes to me and says, I'm going to uphold the law of God, man. I reject Jesus Christ. I'm going to hold the law of God. You can't do it. Even Adam couldn't hold one. Who are you to hold 10 plus? So it's not the answer. 
You see, guilt came quickly to them. They focused on themselves. They had these fig leaves because they want to cover themselves. They feel the shame now. This is what sin do in people's life. The moment you see you want to do it, it looks so pleasurable. The moment you go into trying to do things which you know it shouldn't do, and there's this voice crying out in your conscience, don't, 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 don't. But it looks so pleasurable. It looks so fun to do it. But the moment you do it afterwards, there is the guilt that comes and you try to cover it up. You tell lies. You do these fig leaves. Fig leaves, I don't know about you, but they are prickly. It's not a good covering. And it's not permanent. And here it comes now that God had to kill an animal and give them skins to do that. But that's a different message. Let me finish up this morning. You see, the law of God became the standard. And it's God's standard. And they broke that standard and there's consequences for that. There's consequences. In Isaiah chapter 42 verse 21 it says, The Lord is well pleased with His righteousness sake. He will exalt the law and make it honorable. He will make it honorable. Uh, God's law reveals God's standard for His people living in a fallen world. Even to this day. Even to this day, there's a standard. Why do you think people uh, take the Bible out of schools, out of government? That's God's standard. But we are living in a fallen world, and a fallen world don't want these standards. They want to change it. They want to make it woke, the woke brigade. And let me say that that woke brigade spirit has moved into a lot of churches as well. I'll refrain from going on about that. But Paul loved the law of God. Did you know that? He loved the law of God. And he used it a lot in sharing the gospel. Let me show you. In Romans chapter 7 verse 12, the same Paul, he says, Therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. He used this law. He says it's a holy law. He he didn't say we're going to cut it out. You know, there are some people who say, no, no, we're not under the law anymore. We don't have to read it. We don't have to learn from it anymore. Well, I want to give it to you. I'm going to go and get some scissors and I say, be my guest, cut it out of your Bible. But if you do so, be careful because it's in Revelation. If you take any words out of this Bible, you're in trouble. So as far as I've seen, it's still in my Bible. So the law is still important. Look, Look what Paul did there in Acts. In Acts 28 verse 23, So when they had appointed him a day, many came to him, this is Paul, at his lodging, to whom he explained and solemnly, listen now, listen, don't miss this, testified of the kingdom of God. So that was his message. Persuading them concerning Jesus from what? Both the? Come on church, both the? Law of Moses and the prophets from the morning till evening. So Paul used the law to talk to people about the cross, the gospel. He used the law. Did you know that? He says it right there. There's no other law, the law of Moses, which we know which he found on Mount Sinai, which is the Ten Commandments from morning till evening. He used two things there. He used the law... And he used the prophets. These days people just want to hear prophecies. But you see prophets or prophecy speak to the intellect of a sinner. And it addresses his faith. This is what prophecies do. It talks to the intellect of a sinner. Let me just quickly tell you my testimony. Not the whole one. But I came out of a church. I grew up in a church which is uh, like a Dutch reformed church. They are are not really safe. safe. It's like a cult. It's a new apostolic church. I met my beautiful wife now. She invited me to a Pentecostal church. I called them the happy clappies. (laughs) We made joke of the happy clappies. Me and my friend, my very best friend. They are the happy clappies. The Hallelujah Brigade. That was another name we gave them. So then how the Lord works, I meet a happy clappy. And I fell in love with her. And we started dating and she invited me to a church. And here I'm walking into the church. It was a big church. They were over five, six hundred people. On a Sunday evening, I walk in and I go, there's happy, clappy people. I better watch out for them. And I sit right at the back, right at the back. And she was sitting next to me and I wanted to see that door. If they're going to start doing funny stuff, I'm running. <laughs> nice girl or not, I'm gone. So I'm sitting there 
and they sing and they do their happy clapping and I feel so uncomfortable because I never lift my hands. It feels like gr- shovels hanging next to me. Everybody's happy and clappy and I'm not. I'm just standing there saying, yeah, get it over with. And then I sat down and he started preaching this minister I've never seen in my life. He started preaching a, a word like today. It was straight to the point. It was your sin and it was salvation through Jesus Christ and the cross alone. But I'll tell you what, I was sitting there and every single word that he preached, he was talking to me. He was highlighting things I was doing. And I'm sitting there and I go, this girl told him everything about me. <laughs> That's it. You see, people want prophecy. Oh, oh, there's a prophet in town. I want a personal word from God. No, no, come under the preaching of the word and he will prophesy to you in your life. That's what happened to me, really. I was sitting there and I go, where did this man, he, I never saw this man in my life. And he never saw me. But everything, that is the Holy Spirit. The conviction was laid that night. The Holy Spirit started pulling me in. I wanted to go back. I went to a prayer meeting, and in the prayer meeting there was a 15-minute word from a brother, and I go, they are all gossiping about me, because he's saying the same things. <laughs> you see, this is why I say prophecy speaks to the intellect of a sinner. It speaks to your intellect. I, I don't know. I pray the Holy Spirit, I say to you, the reason why I'm preaching this series is to convict if there's somebody who needs to be convicted in this room, I say, Lord, convict them. If you have already been convicted this morning, I thank the Lord for that. Don't be mad at me. I'm only a messenger. But if you sit here this morning and say, whoa, where did he get that? It is the Lord speaking. The second thing that he used was the law. You see, the law speaks to the conscience of a sinner. That's why the law is important. It talks to your conscience. It talks about your sin. I've only got a few verses. Bear with me. Because there's people who's now going to say online, there's people going to sit here and say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. You are now a legalist. Yeah? You are preaching law. Well, praise the Lord, there are some in this church who know me for years. I'm not a legalist. But where, let, let me just bring the balance in before I end. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus himself said the following words. He said, do not think that I came to destroy the law. In other words, brothers and sisters, it's still in your Bible. It is still applicable. It is still powerful. You still need to learn from it. It is still God's standard. The standard never changed. God didn't change the standard of His law. It's still the same. He says it right there, destroy the law. All the prophets... There is so many prophets in your Bible, Isaiah, Jeremiah, you can name them all. They are all there. He says, I did not come to, to take them away or to destroy them. I did come to destroy, but to fulfill them. Everybody say fulfill. The word there means to bring it to completion. So it wasn't completed there. But he came to bring it to completion. Wow. How did he bring it? By obeying it 100%. He was the only one who obeyed every single one of those laws. And then, and then, not only to obey it, but to take the penalty of that whole law. Do you know what that means? It means for every single sin that every sinner did on this earth, for all of humanity and time, he took all of that penalty upon himself. And you should shout hallelujah. How bad is your sin that who, 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 will, who would want to come up here and tell me about the most secretive sin that you've done? Nobody would want to do that. You will feel ashamed. He took your shame away. And here it is now. He says, I came to fulfill it for assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one yacht or detal will by no means pass from this law till it is fulfilled. You see... In Galatians, the same Paul writes, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. What is going on here now? What is, I thought you said the law is important. Yes, it is. But now there is a new... There. Let me also say, when Jesus was talking, when, when you read the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I want you to hear carefully now. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John was still the Old Covenant. It is New Testament books, but it's still under the Old Covenant. It wasn't the New Covenant. Jesus was coming in under the Old Covenant. 
Jesus died under the old covenant. Because the Bible says that you can only have the New Testament coming out when the testator died. When he died, the New Testament came into it. Yes, it sits in the new books, but it's under the old covenant. This is why he talks about that. I'm going to talk next week about this. I'm going to unpack this a little bit further about walking in the spirit. You are not under the law. The final scripture for today, and I promise it is. I open up in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 8. And this is so telling and important for us. Because this is where we're going to go next week. I've told you how hard the law is. And look, I'm telling you, it is a serious message this morning. I felt times when I preached through those passages, the Holy Spirit's heaviness upon this place. And brothers and sisters, I want to say to you right now, if you sat here this morning and were convicted by anything I said, I ask you to go on your knees before the Lord and start talking to Him. Don't be mad at me. Don't be mad at this church. It's not, got nothing to do with Maranatha. I'm preaching what the Lord lays upon my heart. But I want to bring it into perspective into the New Testament. How is it fulfilled and is it still applicable to us? Yes. Paul writes here to Timothy. He says, but we know, Timothy, we know this. What do we know, Paul? We know that the law is good. Can everybody say amen to that in this church? The law is good. If one uses it lawfully. What is he saying, Paul? We will unpack it next week a little bit further. The law is good if he uses it lawfully. He used it lawfully in, in Acts. I showed you. He persuaded the people starting with what? The law of Moses and with the prophets. And then he goes on to say, knowing this. Okay, what do we know now, Paul? That the law is not made. Everybody say not made. Not made. That's a negative, isn't it? The law is not made for who? For the righteous person. Everybody say righteous person. What does it mean? Who's the righteous people? Can the righteous people put up their hands? Yes, you are righteous if you are born again. Because He's clothed you with a cloak of righteousness. So if you are born again, He says that this law is not made for you. What does He mean? We'll unpack it next week. We'll go deeper. I'm advertising for next week, Brother Mark. He says, this is not for the righteous person. And now, now that I didn't see a lot of hands on, I'll have to spend some time next week to talk about how you get your righteousness, okay? I just tested it. I see, yep, there's good teaching material there. But it's not for the righteous person. So, so Paul, if it's not for the righteous, in other words, it's not for Paul, it's not for Timothy, it's not for Peter, it's not for John. The law, although they came out of the old covenant, once you get born again, you are cloaked with the cloak of righteousness, his righteousness, as now, this is where you're sitting. Then the law is, you're not under the law anymore. You are working with the law, and I'm going to show you next week how you do that. So if it's not for them, Paul, for who are they then? He says, but. Everybody say, but. but. My brother, what does it mean? Sharp contrast. But it is for the lawless. It is for the disobedient. It is for the ungodly. And for the sinner. And for the unholy and the profane. It's for the murderer. It's for the, ma uh, fa uh, uh, fathers and, uh, the murder of fathers and mothers. For the manslayers, for the fornicators. You see, even fornicators. Let it be known that if you're a fornicator, if you can hear my voice, you know, maybe two months from now, if you are fornicating, the law will judge you. There's a law that you are breaking. It is for the sodomites. Man, I can unpack that for you. This world is going down the drain, the pit. Let me withhold that. It's, go, it's for the sodomites. It's for kidnappers. What does it mean by kidnappers? It's for people controllers. It's for liars. You're telling a white lie? The law is going to judge you for that. Perjurers. It's anything or anything that's contrary to sound doctrine according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which has committed to our trust. I know it's hard word today, but praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. If you are mad at me for what things I've said, then I'm glad you're mad. Talk to God about it. Talk to Him about it. You see, I'm not going to come in here and waste my time 
and just talk to you because I like you. I want to come in here and warn you. Now you say I'm born again, I'm washed by the blood of the Lamb, God bless your heart. But you can always take this on board because Paul says, O wretched man that I am. What tense is that? Present tense. Present tense. He says, O wretched man that I am. Now am I saying that he was a sinner, a filthy? No, no. No, no, because he qualifies as he says, the things I want to do, I don't do. Is that you? It certainly is me. And the things I don't want to do, I do. Is that you? It's certainly me. Oh, what is the pastor doing that he shouldn't do? Let the Holy Spirit work with your heart, will you? Go back this week. Open up in Exodus chapter 2 and read the Ten Commandments. Lord willing, I'm going to go through them one by one. Because I want to show you that He's fulfilled every single one of the ten. Every single one of them He fulfilled. And I want to show you how. So that if you don't come to the cross, every single one of those ten is going to judge you. Heavenly Father, I just come to you in the name of Jesus and I thank you, Lord, for your word, which is powerful, Lord. It is sharper, it's living and it's powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It cuts between bone and marrow, spirit and soul. And Father, it is the discerner of the hearts and the minds of everybody. Father, I also know that your word will also not go out and return back void, but it will accomplish everything that it's purposed for. If there are people, Lord, who's been convicted by this word, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will not leave them. Father, if it makes them uneasy or restless, Father, let your Holy Spirit be with every person until, Father, the, 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 the price is settled through the cross of Christ. I thank you, Lord, for your word. If it wasn't for your word, Father, this would only be a social club, and I'm not interested in that, Lord. I'm interested coming here to worship you and to be corrected and to grow in faith and knowledge and in mercy, Father. We pray this in the wonderful name of Jesus, and everybody say amen. amen. I'm a new